thank you thank you very much for having me uh this evening um it's a great honor to be asked and i'm a huge fan of a lot of the work that you do um i'm just gonna think, bear with me i'm just gonna put this um screen sharing on bear with me Uh, yeah, I'm a huge, a huge fan of uh, a lot of what you do uh, in the Burren and a huge fan of the Farming for Nature ambassador films that you do. And uh, I'd like to give special mention, uh, whoever does those films deserves enormous credit. There was a man um, last year, I think one called Thomas uh, O'Connor, and that's a remarkable film. And I've watched it about 20 times. And he says the most marvellous thing at the end of that film, he says, we have to get back to like when we were children, where we think about the farm and we feel excited about it again. And we see it as a place of uh, excitement and change and adventure. And I, I think that was a wonderful, wonderful sentiment. And uh, I very much admire it. Can, can everybody hear me just before I go any further? You can hear? Yeah, we can hear you well. And I don't think there's any message in, is in chat saying that they can't. So I think everyone can hear you well, James. Good. It's a, it's a very strange thing talking into nowhere, isn't it? And I hope you're all keeping well because this COVID is a very strange time indeed. So uh, not only is it an honour to be asked to do this, but it's a delight as well because I don't often get asked to talk about my farm in any depth or my farming, which sounds a little bit strange, but people usually want me to talk about my books and my family and other things. So tonight, um, I hope you'll forgive me if I just talk about the farm and uh, yeah, so I'll make a start. So any of you that have read my books will know that I'm a very, uh, in many ways, a very ordinary farm lad with a very ordinary farm background. That's my father in the middle of the screen. I lost my father five years ago. I'm the little lad on the right hand side. And I didn't even know this photograph existed. And when we got to be, when I was a young man and my dad was in his 40s and 50s, we had a few rough times like fathers and sons can have on a farm. But then my sister found this photograph. I thought, well, it wasn't all that bad, was it? I, I obviously thought the world of my dad then, and I, I did in the latter, the latter stages of his life as well. Um, so um, that's me. That's me in the middle of Beast from the East. Uh, we're a traditional fell farm in the Lake District. We call it fell. That's really old Norse. Uh, fjell is Norwegian to this day. It means mountain or sort of upland, uh, upland grazing land. And yeah, it was minus 17 when that photograph was taken. And I keep hearing about this underfloor heating that you've got in the burn with this limestone that holds the heat. And I think my sheep might like a piece of that. So uh, I might have to fetch some sheep someday uh, to there. And yes, I've got a funny, yes, let's uh, address it head on. I have a very funny life because I'm also a writer now, but I spend most of my days uh, on our farm uh, and looking after my sheep and cattle, that's, that's the most important thing in my life. Um, but I also write these books and I have a, a sort of second life where people know me for doing that. This is my son, um, Isaac, when he was a little bit younger than he is now. Well, my first book came out. And this is what you look like when your mum takes you to Waterstones, the bookshop, and says, look excited because your dad's at home labbing sheep and we need a photograph from publication day. So that's what you look like. But I'll be the first to say very little of this is about me, really. Um, I'm, I'm from a very old uh, farming system, as many of you are. These are, this is a picture from, I don't know when, the 1930s or 40s. Um, but that could be taken now. The jackets have changed a little bit and there aren't so many pipes. But this is basically what me and my mates still look like now when we get among the sheep. The sheep have changed a little bit for the better, I think, since that photograph. Um, but I'm, I'm very lucky to be from... It's very, very old uh, farming system. It's so old that it's a world, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And it's, 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 it's an intact system as well. So we have this amazing pastoral landscape where the walls are still there, the outgangs where we go to the fell are still there, uh, the lonings and lanes that we, we take sheep to and from the, the fell are still there. And I've always, I've always loved that. Every, every bit of me has always loved that, really. Uh, I love the stories that the old men and women told when I was young. And I was very proud and from a, from a proud farming family. I wouldn't say the best farming family, but a family just like any other that lived that life. And uh, I grew up very proud of it. And then was a little bit dismayed when I got to school to realize that other people thought this was uh, not, quite the, not quite the thing to do if you're a sort of bright lad and that, or lass and that you were meant to get out and go to London or Manchester or somewhere fancy and do other things. And this, this wasn't what you were meant to do. 
and I rebelled against that and uh, made a a mess and wasted my schooling really the first time around because I just wanted to get back to it and to be part of it. So that's that's my grandfather. My grandfather bred beef short on cattle and dairy short on cattle. Uh, was a good stockman. Stockman's the word that we would use. I don't know if that's the word you use in Ireland for somebody that was known for making a good job of the cattle and sheep, and looking after the land well. He'd, uh, I think he might have been slightly troublesome individually. He broke out of the family uh, and went off and set off his own farm on a, on a rented farm on the Lowther estate in the north of England. And then uh, in the 1960s, must have been doing quite well because he bought an old, so he was on a rented farm initially, and then he bought the farm that I now live on uh, in the Lake District Fells. And it was, I don't think it was too posh, it still isn't. It was a sort of hard uh, upland farm at 1100 feet up, but he could see how we could have just to borrow the money to afford it. I think we might still be paying that money back, but that's by the by. Um, and he was, uh, yeah, I, I, th I thought he was a great man when I was about 10 years old. And then you get a little bit older and you learn about people's imperfections. And I'm not sure he was great in all areas of his life, but he was, he was a great storyteller and a good farmer and a, and a, a man that, that spent a lot of time with me when I was a boy. And um, actually, I would say that to any of you that have young, uh, young men and women, boys and girls around you, that do your best to show some belief in them, particularly if they're interested in your farms and your farming, because they'll never forget that. And it puts a little bit of pride in you that lasts a long time. Certainly that was the, the effect my grandfather had on me. And yeah, we, we're not only a very old farming system as you are, but we've been written about for a very long time as well. So Wordsworth wrote about us and Beatrix Potter became one of us in, in her, her old age. We know her as Mrs. Healis because she bred Herdwick sheep, and this is Water Lily, a famous Herdwick ewe. And I love this photograph because the, the, the real expert here was Tom Story, the, the youngish man holding the sheep. And they'd had one hell of a fallout because she hired him to come and breed Herdwick sheep and he wouldn't do, he wouldn't do what she told him. Because as far as he was concerned, uh, a shepherd was the boss when it came to breeding the sheep. And she could have got rid of him actually and thrown her weight around and her money around, but she didn't. They learned to uh, suffer each other and to work together in a way. And that photograph, there's a sort of slightly wicked grin on her face that says we, we just about worked out how to do this between us. And I've always thought that was, that was lovely that she had the wit and the sense to, to show some hu humility and to, to realize that he was the man that knew about that. And our world isn't, isn't dead. If you read the, nothing but the Guardian, you'd think maybe that farming was on the way out, but that isn't what I see in the day to day. This is the Kirby Stephen auction mart here. That's one of my friends, Jeff Marwood, selling his tuck lambs. That wasn't a photograph from today, but this actual sale and this moment happened again today. I think he's been selling uh, Swelldale lambs to £6,000 top price today. They're a remarkable stockman. But I would draw your attention to the, the number of people around the ring. And yes, actually, they're nearly all men, which is maybe not ideal. There should be more women because there are some very brilliant female shepherds here and in that world. But this isn't a world that's disappearing. It's a world that tens of thousands of people live in and work in and have enormous pride in what they do and love for what they do. So yes, there's less of them than there was a century ago, but there's still a lot of them doing it. And I grew up being proud to be part of that community. And I still am. This is in Wasdale. Um, I wasn't going to say this, but I've just remembered actually, I spoke to a historian one day and he was telling me that uh, the Vikings settled a lot of the landscape where we're at. And there's apparently a line somewhere down the middle of England, not far from the Pennines, where we know that the Vikings that came in from the West had been in Ireland for 50 or so years because they'd changed the dialect and the spelling of place names. So this is Wasdale. This was settled by Irish Vikings. It sounds daft, that doesn't it? But it's true. And then if you get so several valleys further over, you're into land um, which was settled from Vikings that had come in from Denmark or Northern France or wherever. So this is one of our traditional shepherd's meets where we show the sheep to see what's the best in the valley. And yeah, this, I've just sold it up. The, the man in the blue t-shirt there just came and bought a tup, uh, tup, a ram off me just a few days ago. So these are my people really. And the lad with the ginger hair and the green shirt is a lad called Joe Weir. And we work very closely with him on the breeding of our sheep. And this is the mountain and the moorland where we graze our sheep. So we have traditional fell grazing rights to go up there. Um, there's a whole discussion to be had about whether that's, uh, that, that habitat's as good as it can be. We can come back to that later, but for at least a thousand years, and we think maybe four or five thousand years, people 
probably my people, but it doesn't matter whether they're mine or not. People have gone to and from their mountains with the same flocks of sheep. So we think my flock of sheep have been going to and from that mountain for at least a thousand years and possibly four or five thousand. There's no way of knowing, but that's how remarkable that system is. And the whole landscape is designed around the coming and going of those sheep. So you can see over in the distance, uh, I don't know if you can see where, where I put my mouse there, but that's where my farmstead is. And we walk these sheep to and from the fell. We call that a longing on the way to and from the fell. And the whole landscape pattern and a lot of the ecology of this landscape is uh, shaped by that grazing. This is fetching the sheep home from the fell. Uh, so there's 10 flocks of sheep live on that common land and they're gathered collectively. So it takes 10 men and women and 25 sheep dogs, a couple of days to, to fetch those sheep down from the fell. And if there's a finer way to spend two days than gathering sheep on a fell, I haven't discovered it yet because it's, it's a remarkable thing and never ceases to make me feel very, very privileged to be part of it. And obviously it's a, it's a landscape of the walls and the dogs and the hardy sheep and be very similar to a lot of your practices. And we have books. We haven't got a lot of literary books in our culture, but we have books. Uh, by the way, do you say books or books? So we say books in our dialect. So this is one of the, the, the books that you would have. It's the shepherd's guide for our landscape. And each farm uh, has a different uh, lug mark. Lug doesn't mean here. It sounds like it does, but it means law mark in Viking. And, and then you have your smit mark, which is your paint mark to say whose sheep belong to who. And the, some, some shepherds are like scholars. They know this book inside out, the hundreds of pages of it. Uh, others like me would just know the sheep on the neighboring fells. And we know exactly who to return a sheep to. And there's a very strong set of values and ethics about how you behave on a common. Uh, you would never claim an unmarked or a white lamb. You would, and, and you're held to account if you, if you do anything beneath those high standards. And yeah, and for the last hundred plus years, we've, we've had the flock books for the breeds that we have. And one of the most, one of the proudest things that you can do as a shepherd in our landscape is to be celebrated in those flock books um, for having bred uh, particularly good sheep. I've been fortunate a few times to have bred sheep to go in the flock book. And that's, that's about as immortal as you can get as a shepherd. And most of my shepherding friends will judge me when I get to the end of the road by whether I've bred the kind of sheep that would go into be celebrated in that way. And uh, I suspect me, well, I hope my, my literary achievements are, are, are a footnote with the shepherds because I'm one of them and would hope to be respected as such at the end of the day. And my father was a very, uh, uh, I mean it in the best sense of the word, a very ordinary, decent, hardworking man. Worked on a shearing trailer in the summer, worked in the auction mart as a drover part of the time, did his own farming, uh, was a real grafter, a uh, tremendous fellow for working, uh, very well thought of, I think. Um, yeah, even when he was in his 60s, I mean, he's about 60 year old on that photograph, he could, uh, he would be clipping 200 plus sheep a day and giving some of the younger shearers a run for the money. So I'm going to read you a little bit from my book. Uh, and I thought I'd read a bit from from when I was young, really, from when I was hanging out with my grandfather. One morning, he lifted the wooden hand-carved latch or sneck on the stable door. The handle was worn smooth from decades of use by rough farm hands and rose softly above the sneck. The rusty door hinges groaned slightly as he pushed the door open about four inches. He peered through the gap and I pushed beneath his chest to see and feel him tremble with excitement through his coat. What's happening? Shh! Keep quiet, he said. She's falling. The stable was dimly lit by one half-hearted light bulb hanging from a twisted grey electric wire decorated with cobwebs from the beams. The once whitewashed walls were brown with years of cattle shit from their legs and bellies rubbing against them. The cobbled floor was six inches deep with white sun-bleached straw. Beneath the dim bulb, the bay mare twisted and turned as if in pain. She was staring at her side, which was swollen. Some full limb or other, pushing up jagged beneath the taut skin as if she'd swallowed a stepladder. And then she lay down in the straw. And after a minute or so, a contraction shook the whole shivering body like an earthquake. She extended her head out like a corpse and groaned. And Grandad trod carefully towards her rear end, motioning for me to stay where I was. I waited through each contraction, not knowing what was happening. Then she moved a little and Grandad could see her fold's legs jutting out, strangely long, angular and sharp. He felt past the legs and smiled. 
The mare shook again and pushed, and the legs seemed to lurch out four or five inches. He waited for the next tremor and then pulled at the legs. This time they came even further and a nose was visible and a flash of white seen through the blood and translucent yellowish birth sack. And then the mare stood up, seesawing to her feet and the fall clattered down to the straw with a thud that made me wince. My grandfather cleaned its mouth of fluids and leapt to the door before the mare tried to kick him. An hour later, after they had given her some quiet time, the mare was shaking gently, nervously, as the foal prodded her side with its head, looking for a teat. A week later, the foal was running around the field, learning to use its two big legs and snorting defiantly, as Grandad watched it from the field gate. Grandad was still a horseman, 40 years after he'd bought his first tractor. So, bear with me if I can make this work. So it's not all about me. I'm from a very long line of people that did the same things that I do, and I, and I delight in that and glory in it. I think life's bigger than any of us, isn't it, really? And, and that's something I enjoy being part of. This is my son, Isaac, watching his ewe lamb. To, it's two or three years ago now, when he's grown up a bit. But uh, I looked at him that day looking like that, and I didn't know whether he was going to be the next generation of farmer. But he's, uh, he's come to lately, and he's, he and his sisters are keen. I've got four children two girls and two boys, and they all play their part in the farm. This is my daughter, Molly. Uh, we're, we're proud breeders of Herdrick sheep and try and breed good ones and show and sell them. Uh, last week, we just had our top sales and we, we had a top price of 4,500 guineas. And I think our top 10 averaged over a thousand this year, this autumn. So I'm, I'm very pleased at that. Uh, I'm a big believer that girls should do everything that boys can do and can do everything that boys can do. Um, let me just get rid of that silly thing in the corner. And my, both of my daughters are very capable young ladies and uh, can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any of the boys. And my, my farming pride and joy is my flock of Herdrick sheep. Uh, I, I'm everything more of them than anybody else, but I think they're tremendous. I think they look like peas in a pod. And it's taken me 20 years. I, I inherited a good flock from a neighbour, bought them from a neighbour. And I've worked very hard on getting them just how I want them. And uh, if you can't tell them sheep apart, I'm delighted because I want a sheep. I want a flock of sheep that's consistent and all of the same type. And that's what we care about greatly. And they have to be practical and hardy. I've got increasingly as I get older, I've got less and less time for silly breeds of things and things that require too much looking after, false looking after. So these sheep can live in minus 15, minus 20, and they're remarkably tough. And in the last few years, we've gone back into cattle. We were a sheep farm for a long time, perhaps too long. The more I learn about uh, good grazing and good land management, the more I think we need a diversity of animals. So we, we've gone into belted Galloway cattle and perhaps some of you breed them as well. And there was a lot of good breeders in Ireland. And uh, also uh, love working with my dogs. Uh, so we are border collie dogs. We just have another of a pup at the moment that we've just got. And I, like, I enjoy trying to train them. So I just actually lost the middle dog two months ago, Tan. He was a tremendous dog, a real athlete. And he just got to an age and he burned out and disappeared. And well, went down quite quickly. We thought the world of him. So that paints a bit of a picture of, of who I am and where I'm from. Uh, but the sad truth is we're living in this broken age, aren't we? Where we're learning all sorts of sad truths on a day-to-day -day -day basis about, uh, particularly about what's happened to nature and I think any of us that are prepared to be honest know that we've all played a part in that and our families have played a part in that. Um, and in, in some ways it's, it's ironic and sad because in some ways we've become too good of farmers. If, if by good farmer you mean produce one hell of a lot of stuff very cheaply. And we unfortunately, uh, and I, I didn't like it when I first began to learn about it years ago and I'm sure many of you didn't yet when you first begin to learn that farming is fingered with the blame for quite a lot of that, um, that our land use is inevitably having these huge effects, um, that's a difficult thing to swallow um, and a difficult thing to digest and to think about how we might do something different. It's not an easy thing to get your head around. And certainly in the pastoral bits of Britain and Ireland, it's not a secret to many of us what's happened because we've lived through it, haven't we? And my book was about that. So we've gone from these landscapes that were patchworks with lots of different things happening and then managed and grazed in different ways and lots of niches for different things to a sort of simplified stripped away landscape where there's far less places for nature. So the question that came to obsess me over the last 10 or 15 years, many of you I'm sure, is what we can what can we do about it? 
do we bury our heads in the sand or be defiant and say it's nothing to do with us or nothing can be done? Or do we do the best we can to try and make things better? And I've come to the conclusion uh, and I've read an enormous amount of books about ecology and I've had all sorts of ecologists and environmentalists come to my farm. I've come to the conclusion that there's three questions we probably have to start asking ourselves on farms. The first one is what was this place before we before we wrecked it, I suppose, uh, or spoiled it or changed it. And, uh, so, so I think we need some kind of understanding of what the native habitats were and the native processes, natural processes. Um, what were the habitats that existed before we changed it all? And have we gone too far? And what were the natural processes that made it tick? And I, I think that's very interesting because once you've got your head around understanding those things and they'll be different in the borough and perhaps than in the Lake District, you can start to do something about it. So the question I'm trying to answer through my farming now as best I can, and that might be imperfect, is how can we recreate at least some of that on our farm, the habitats and the processes? So I'll give you an aerial view of the farm here. Uh, this is the 40 something odd fields that we have on our farm. Um, that's about a third more fields than we had when I was maybe 25 years old. We've been a stripping away of, in our landscape. You can see there was a lot of old hedgerows and they'd slowly disappeared. Uh, there was a lot of woodland and that had shrunk and disappeared over time. Uh, and there was a gradual intensification of how you farmed grass and a gradual loss of a lot of the craftsmanship in the hedgerows and other things that had kept the biodiversity there. And we were ending up with these big lumps of land that were, were set stocking basically with sheep. And you fool yourself that you're doing exactly what your grandfather or his grandfather did. And then when you start to look at it, you think, hang on a minute, this is there's a lot of hedgerows in the past that aren't there anymore. There's just the remnants of them left. So there's been this stripping away taking place. That's what our farm looks like. Uh, the fell behind, the mountain behind isn't, isn't farmed by us. It's a piece of land managed by another farmer that belongs to the National Trust. And it's part of a, I'm not sure how effective it is, but it's part of a, a rewilding project where they're letting the natural habitats come back. Uh, I, I live in the stone barn there and that's our farm buildings in the background. We have 185 acres that we own, another 100 or so acres that we graze for other people at different times of the year. Uh, we run about 600 sheep, uh, 300 ewes and followers, but a simpler way of putting that. And then we uh, run about 15, 20 cattle. And they're just building up at the moment. Um, and it was a patchwork. You can see a hell of a lot of new fence posts in there because that's, that's a lot of the work we've done has been A, putting back in the 18th century patchwork, the hedgerows and mixed habitats and small fields and then B putting in things that haven't existed or maybe never existed for a very long time things like these uh, river riparian habitats and corridors were planted 6,000 trees when we started in 2012 and I think we're up to about 15,000 trees since uh, that's another view of that so we're trying to put back in the woodland that's one of the obvious things you can do uh, not not abandoned uh, we do some rough grazing of cattle in those woodlands. We've had some pigs in there actually this uh, summer, but that gives you an example of how we can start to put some of that woodland back into there. And we're getting uh, grazing over the fences as, the, as that spreads out with the cattle and sheep. And we're thinking about shelter and leaf matter. And also, uh, I'll come back onto it in a minute, but we're able to manage, um, manage our grazing much better when we get back in those little fields. But it's a tough old landscape. That's a picture of my dad maybe a couple of years before he died. This is a landscape where it can rain and be cold and wet for six months of the year. Tough old place. And we get a lot of flooding. Uh, we're in the Eden Valley uh, catchment. Some of you that follow the news will know that Carlisle's been flooded twice, had record floods twice downstream from us in the last 15 years. Um, I think in the previous 100 years, they never once broke the record on the bridge down there. Uh, that record's been broken twice in about 10 years with devastating floods. And the, the belief amongst the people that know about rivers and flooding is that we've done such a good job of draining this landscape, it's a huge area of, the catchment is a huge area of the north of England, that the flooding, peak flooding gets to the city about an hour faster than it used to. It doesn't help that the city's been expanded into the floodplain and all sorts of other issues, but there's clearly a, a, an issue with land management and how we hold on to water high up in the catchment. And again, I didn't like that when I first learned about it 20 years ago, but you, you grow up and get your head around it and realise that you have to play your part. So uh, this is a, another image of our farm. You can see quite a lot of trees. There's some ponds in the bottom that we've been building as part of natural flood management. There's just winding down to the bottom of there. You can't really see from that picture, but we've been part of projects where we've re-wiggled the rivers, basically put them back into a, a longer 
wiggly course. Uh, we've been building places to hold on to flood water. And yeah, and we're trying to put all of those, see where those ash trees are, and it's sort of overgrown, outgrown 200 year old hedgerows, put them back in and get them healthy again. And yeah, we, we do a lot of work with the, the river trusts and we can make our habitat much better for the salmon and sea trout that come up our, uh, we call them becks or streams. So we're working on that. Uh, the corridors we planted and fenced off in 2012 with the River Trust, we were slow converts. Uh, and I write about that in the book. We, we did it really because we were trying to get the, put the farm back together and we were short of money to fence it. So when very clever River Trust people came and said, we'll do a deal with you, we'll do the fencing. If you give up some of the, the key bits of habitat that we want, we went along with that. And, and then we discovered we rather liked it. And, and, and a lot of good things happened in those spaces. And what we saw very, very quickly was nature come back when we gave it a chance. That's the long and the short of it. So a farm that had been more or less set stocked and permanently short grazed, suddenly you have these areas and you can see way more insects than you've seen before. Within six months of fencing off some of those areas, the barn owl came back to our farm after 10 or 15 years of being away. And we all stood and looked at this barn owl one night over some of our fields. And everybody had, a, I looked around and everybody in my family had a smile on their face. And they, it, it didn't have to be said, but I could tell what everybody was thinking. We don't have to be the bad guys. We can put a lot of this stuff back together and it can make our lives better. It's beautiful and it's good. And uh, we can play a part in making things better. And since then, we've, we've got braver and braver, and less and less uh, recalcit recalcitrant, if that's a word. Uh, and we've started to get really into uh, trying to put the nature back into our farm. So I've got clumps of thistles on my farm. Up until about 10 years ago, I'd have been out with a knapsack and some, uh, some spray, and I got, I got rid, rid of them. Uh, but you see, if you can just make some spaces around the edges or in the rougher bits of the farm, you get amazing clouds of butterflies this summer we've had and uh, just everything needs a chance don't we and we've been too good at tidying up too good at making things everything perfect and yeah I, I've got to get onto soil I haven't got a lot of time left but um, I, my real passion now is I was looking at some of those habitats we created around the fields with a friend of mine that's a botanist a few years ago and he said you think nature's in the edge bits don't you and I said, yeah, they were proud of them. He said, you're wrong, nature's in the fields. And he, he did a botanical survey and we had a uh, hundred or more species of plants, wildflowers and grasses in our meadows. We had nearly a hundred in some of our cattle pastures and we're between 40 and 60 in our sheep pastures. And he said, no, you need to start thinking about the fields themselves as generating biomass and biodiversity. And in the last five years, I've become obsessed with soil. It's amazing stuff. This is this is amazing stuff that keeps us. You look after this properly, it looks after you properly as a farmer. So I'm obsessed with soil. So what are we doing? Well, we've had to teach ourselves with the helps of various experts to graze much longer grass than we used to. You'll see there, I've turned a little bit over. So we're grazing, uh, particularly in the peak growing season, we're grazing much longer. We're staying out for much longer, um, trying to do at least two 45 or 50 day breaks in grazing in the peak growing season or one 90 day break. And you get these really long swords, probably too long for a lot of sheep. Uh, and then we're mob grazing them as fast as we can and trampling as much on the surface, particularly in summer. And then you get this amazing thatch and you're seeing, I go back up, the, the transformation in our soil, the dark sort of hummusy soil, hummusy soil uh, is amazing. It's sort of loamy, rich, dark soil. Uh, very, very quickly improving. Um, obsessed with earthworms, get yourself a spade, get out in your fields if you're not already doing this. Um, the other fantastic thing is, so how many spades can you count in an earthworm of, uh, in a spade full of soil is a fantastic measure. Another is how many birds you see in your field. And um, yeah, and maybe the best of the whole lot is to feel whether the ground gives under your feet. Uh, really good healthy soil gives, it gives about half an inch or an inch under your foot as you're walking across your fields and I get massive delight out of that. It's because it's healthy and aerated. And we're using the livestock to do that. There's a lot of talk about sort of anti-livestock talk. I don't, uh, oh, sorry, let me, let's be honest about it. There are things you can do with livestock. There are things you can feed livestock that are ecologically disastrous, but there's ways you can farm livestock that are fantastic for soil, fantastic for biodiversity. So we're using these ladies, these ladies that I'm every bit as passionate about as, I've, as I ever was. And we're using them in a long break rotational uh, grazing re regime. Uh, particularly in summer, that's having a transformational effect on our farm. 
and we're using the cattle as well and that's what it looks like in the middle of summer my granddad would have said i was wasting grass but then my granddad didn't know about feeding the soil with organic matter on the surface and muck piss saliva trampling that's the stuff that feeds your soil to hell with synthetic fertilizers to hell with paying corporations lots of money let's farm like farming should be done where we look after the soil and we use natural processes and what we're seeing by doing that is that uh, and we're getting away from as many chemicals as we can minimizing the use of them what we're seeing is explosions of insect life in the dung uh, we're getting dung beetles everywhere on the farm uh, nothing i like to see more now that's the whole of a dung beetle i hope you're not having any suppers uh, and fungi i want to see fungi everywhere because when we get that dead thatch on the top of the soil uh, we know that we're getting our soil healthy again and uh, i'll maybe share this presentation afterwards but what we're finding uh, and don't worry about these numbers is within three two to three years we can put two percent soil organic organic matter percentage increase on our soil and that's having a remarkable effect on our land just by that different grazing regime just by using photosynthesis more effectively and using the cattle and sheep more effectively and there's a way to go i think we can get five four five percent at least extra uh, organic matter in our soil so they're peaty soils they run at about 15 percent organic matter when they're set stopped for a long time i think we can get them to 17 18 maybe 19 percent so yes how have we done this we've done this by being in every flipping environmental sun and yes they're an absolute pain in the backside so that, that's a picture of part of our farm each one of those numbers is a different code it's wildly bureaucratic it's an absolute pain uh, i keep getting snotty emails from the, the government agency telling me that i broke some minor done some minor infringement of some bureaucratic rule and i'm just going to do the best i can and keep going through it but it has helped to try and put that patchwork back into our landscape and what do we need in these landscapes? If we're going to look after them pro properly, we need proper boundaries, we need proper farming people, we need proper craft skills like walling and hedging and all that stuff that makes our landscapes and our communities work. That's my neighbour, Derek Wilson. We don't let anybody retire in these valleys. We work them to death rigorously. Um, and I love to see now on my farm diversity because the more we learn about how to keep animals healthy, and how we stay healthy by eating the right kind of food is that we need this diversity of plants. So I want my fields to be full of flowers. I know many of yours are. I want my hay meadows, because I'm a competitive uh, little boy, I want my hay meadows to, before I die to be the best in the Lake District. We're up to about 105 species in them at the moment. There's still work to be done. We've just put six and a half thousand new plug plants in with rarer plants just to get them better. I am as proud of those flowers as any, any, any of my livestock these days. And I want to see spiders and I want to see uh, longer vegetation. I want to have areas of the farm set aside where we can, for much longer periods, where we can get really fantastic other plants, wetland plants and other things. That's meadow sweet. That's the kind of thing we're looking for on part of the farm, just these banks of flowers and diversity. And uh, my hot tip is make friends with ecologists and people that know about stuff you don't know about. There's no shame in not knowing about moths or flowers or anything else. Find people who are into that stuff, get them on your farm and get them to teach you because it makes life richer. We've had to make some tough decisions. So my father, I breed Herdwick sheep, my father bred Swaledale sheep. To farm in the way that we want to, we need to simplify the, the flock structure to stay out of fields for longer. So we sold my father's flock of sheep. That it wasn't easy. I wanted to, I suppose, prove to me dead dad that I could do that as well as he could. And I've actually had to bail out of that. I've, I've decided to specialise in the, the, the Belties and the Herbics. And when I walk around the farm, I want to see the base layer of our food pyramid really, really rich. I want to see lots of voles. I want to see lots of frogs. I want to see lots of caterpillars in summer. I want to see lots of fungi. And what we're trying to do is to mix it all up so talking about those natural processes we've just brought pigs onto the farm in the last year just a small number but we're using them to mix things up in the woodland and the nature areas get that dynamism that you would have had from wild boars and other things we've brought bees onto the farm i don't know anything about bees and every time i go near them i get stung but my friend maddie is a beekeeper she's fetched them on and they're benefiting from the wildflower bits that we have so we're using these areas that theoretically we've lost some production we're using them for other kinds of production and the pigs have been a revelation so uh last night i had the best roast pork i've ever had in my life because we butchered this particular pig a little while ago 
and it had lived entirely in our nature areas. It had done a tremendous job and then it's providing use to us and we're going to sell the pork from them and do more next year. But it all comes back to having the people here, the people that love the livestock and love the land. We can do remarkable things when we get ourselves in the right place mentally. I'm as proud of my herdric sheep as I've ever been, probably more so. I can fit them into this kind of patchwork landscape if we build it. And that's, that's the sort of thing I'm aiming for. I want a landscape where I can graze these very special sheep, I can move them on within three days to another pasture, and we can have all the nature around us. I don't want to be one of the bad guys, and I'm sure you don't. I want to be part of the solutions. And we've been working with the River Trust on more ambitious projects about rewiggling rivers. We've had the diggers in. We've done some pretty heavy engineering to get rid of the heavy engineering of the 1980s when the water utility companies came and straightened all our rivers and put them in canal banks. It's crackers, but we're putting it back together. And then we're doing this thing on our farm where we keep identifying the least productive bit of the farm. And then we're saying, all right, what's the best thing we could do for nature on that place? So bear in mind, it's costing us nearly nothing in terms of productivity. And then we're turning a, a boggy bit into a series of ponds. Amazing, absolutely amazing habitats that we're starting to create. Am I paying for all of this with, with a magic money tree or with, by writing books? No, I'm doing this by working really closely with environmental organisations and charities. And they're coming to the farm with the money and I'm saying, all right, here's this thing we can do. What do you think? And they're coming up with their own ideas and forcing me to go further. And it's good. It's exciting. Uh, so we've moved rivers. About a month ago, uh, two, th sorry, three months ago, we saw little egrets back in our valley for the first time. Never, ever seen them before on our farm. Amazing. And everybody stood with their mouths open again and said, wow, this is it. This is what we're all about. Let's get it done. Uh, we've re-wetted a lot of the peat bogs on our fell uh, with sort of buns to hold the water on to stop the 19th century drainage. We're farming the cattle around, around these little paddocks, around these ponds that we've built. I'm nearly done. Don't worry, organisers, I'm nearly off. And we're planting trees left, right and centre and we're doing them as shelter belts. And we're doing them on the edge of the farm and we're using them as, uh, to, to widen the gap from us, from our neighbours, so that we can run a closed herd and a closed flock without touching nose, noses, so that we reduce transmission of diseases. And we, we just want, it, we want to do it. So I think shelter in the wind is just like buying feed. Might as well have shelter. And we're doing a lot of traditional craft things like laying the hedgerows. All around the farm laying those hedgerows. We have school visits. Uh, our environmental scheme encourages us to have school visits, so we try and bring them on the farm and they help us plant trees. And we work with other amazing people like my friend Maria, who's an entrepreneur that lives on a farm. She's made tweed out of our wool, makes these amazing bags. You can see them at Dodson Wood on social media. But what gets me out of bed in the morning? My herd with sheep. They'll always be my passion. They're my great love. But it doesn't mean, there's a sort of idea you can't be a livestock farmer and you can't love nature. It's the biggest load of rubbish I've ever heard. You can be both. Many of you will be both, and I, I believe in that too. And my end note I'm going to leave you with, because I don't want to take up more than my fair share of time, is we can do this. You can do it, and I can do it, and we can make things better if we can persuade the public to back us and the politicians to back us. Um, you love your land, I'm sure you do, and I love mine. And we can put it back together and the public want this the vast majority of the british the irish public they want their landscapes looked after properly they want good food they don't want to be relying on processed rubbish that comes from america and a bunch of nasty corporations i haven't got time for my second reading but we're, we're going to get readings from jane instead ignore that slide so yes i did write a book about all of this called english pastoral it's a memoir it's as good effort as i could manage and it tells the story of my family over those three generations uh, I'm going to stop. I've gone a couple of minutes over, but I'm going to say a huge thank you to all of you. I'm a huge admirer of what you do. Please keep going with it. Please work with your organisers uh, and your leaders to, to get these schemes in place. And I hope to come and visit you someday. Thank you very much. James, that was that was beautiful. Thank you so much. And I want to thank you not just for your presentation today, but just for doing all the work that you're doing as the guardian of your piece of land. I think it makes people like me who are not farmers uh, just feel inspired and optimistic for the future. Um, Brendan might start with the questions. James, do you want to stop sharing your screen so people can see you a bit better? Okay, let's, um, let's do that. Stop sharing. So thanks. Friendly. Um, so Brendan Dunford here, I work with... Brendan, we, we can't see your face. <laughs> Maybe you want to tilt your uh, oh, screen okay. a little bit. 
Okay, sorry, I can't see my face either. So is that okay? Oh no, you've you've stopped your screen now. <laughs> it was just your forehead we could see earlier. Oh yeah, that's okay. perfect. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, listen, um, thanks, um, James. That was, I think, a really inspiring presentation. Um, full of the, it was like an affirmation of, of farming. I think it was a very positive story. It was a very uh, relevant story and a very timely story, I think, as well at the moment. We've had so many fantastic comments. One lovely comment back from Shane O'Brien. Uh, Shane says, thanks for putting this together, especially at these tough times. Finding it tough sometimes, but occasions like this are such a heart lifter by allowing people of similar and aspiring mindsets to connect with each other. And I think looking at the audience tonight, I recognize an awful lot of farmers in the audience, some of the Farming for Nature ambassadors and local farmers from here in the Burren, some people working in nature conservation. Uh, and I think the wonderful thing about uh, when you speak, James, I think you speak to everybody. Everybody can see the relevance in, in what you say. So thank you very much for that. Um, there's tons of questions. <laughs> Either you're going to be up until midnight typing in responses, or I'll try and cover some of them as best I can here, James. I think our experience here in the Burn and uh, in Ireland, we, we had a meeting today with a bunch of um, locally led projects across Ireland where farmers are working with scientists to come up with solutions for their areas and being hugely successful in doing so. I think so there is a real positive message in there. But I guess the first question people will ask is how scalable is this? How relevant is it in terms of the farm economics? Can people, people afford uh, to farm like this? What reassurance can you give them? Okay, so uh, the first thing to say is, um, can I, could I afford just for my own farm without any help from the general public charities or environmental schemes to do the capital spend? No, I couldn't. I needed the help. I, I, I needed the schemes to enable us to do the fencing to do a lot of this work. I needed the help of the river trusts to, to do the wetland creation without a shadow of a doubt. But does the rest of it make sense once that's done? Yes. So. The, the grazing without buying synthetic fertilizers, uh, the minimizing of input costs like uh, cattle and sheep feed to the bare minimum, they're getting away from uh, being over reliant on sheep wormers and other products. Um, the return to native breeds, uh, so you're producing stuff from your, from your land with very little cost associated with it. Those are, those are not only a good idea, they're absolutely vital to the survival of my farm. So we, uh, we had the best year we've had for five or six years last year. We just got our accounts back. And if there's anybody in my family doubting what we're doing, they're not telling me because we, we were losing quite a bit of money up until five or six years ago, trying to farm uh, in the way that we'd always done. And the more we make these changes, the more I can see we're becoming secure. We're diversifying our income, we're cutting our costs, and we're we're finding ways to make this, I'm the most hopeful I've ever been about our small farm surviving. Fantastic. Following on, uh, another question from er Elliot Lormer here, which I think is very relevant. Do some of your farming oh, contemporaries, yeah. like we saw uh, in the photo at the auction market, challenge you that your approach is not proper farming? And if they do, how do you respond to this type of challenge? Well, the, we actually have an opposite problem here in this valley. There's so many people into this stuff that there's some debate about whether I'm leading the charge or whether I'm following some others that started years ago. Um, the, the truth is there's some brilliant farmers in this valley and they're not, they're not following me as some sort of guru. They're, they've come to the same conclusions. They're working with the same sort of people. They're doing wonderful stuff. Um, my, my more conventional farming friends are maybe less into some of this than I am now but they're not coming to me saying I'm making a mess of the farm. They're coming to me saying, bye, you've got a lot of grass, James. And how are you doing this? And are, are, you, not, are you not using any fertilizer? Tell us how that works. So when we, when we have meetings in this room, with, we have a nature friendly farming partnership with 20 members. When we have meetings about soil health or getting away from synthetic fertilizers, it isn't just a bunch of hippies in the room. It's all of the farmers here in the room because they're into this. Uh, they weren't 15 years ago, they are now. There's a revolution happening in people's uh, interest in this. There's a lot of farmers here. So it, it does change when you get 20 miles down the valley to where there's more intensive dairy or arable farms. There's, a, there's still a division between us and them. But in these more marginal landscapes, there's a long history of working with schemes. There's a long history of working to deliver some kind of public benefit. And I, I think it's transformational at the moment. So there's a million trees been planted in the Lake District in the last five years. So I, I'm not worried about it being scalable in the Lake District. The change is already up and running. 
Fantastic. Um, sometimes here in in in, in um, the Burn and, and elsewhere in Ireland, we talk about um, working with farmers in terms of um, farming for nature, and like it's about the, the pocket, the head, and the heart. In a sense, it has to be make financial sense. Um, you know, you have to have a belief in it, as you certainly do. But then there's the technical side of things. Um, so if you're a beef farmer or a dairy farmer, you have access to very good advice. Uh, so we have a question here from Andy Bleasdale, a colleague who works with our National Parks and Wildlife Service. Have you any constructive advice for nature authorities as to how to better engage with farmers? What are we doing wrong and what could we do better? Um, I think, well, I think the lesson, I think there's some excellent examples in this valley. So we have our nature friendly farming group has a local uh, lad, young man um, called Danny, who's a member of the local community. He was a mechanic. He has a personal interest in natural flood management and river restoration. He's made it his own business with the support of some of the farmers to, to talk to everybody, to get an idea of the kind of things they're willing to do on their land. And then he's of his own volition with our support, he's packaging that into things that the funders can pay for. So I, th I think working with, one of the lessons there, I think working with local people is a good idea. I think going in uh, and li genuinely listening to farmers is a good idea. I think, yes, yes, there are always gonna be some grumpy farmers who are not pleasant to go and meet at the farm gate. Let's let's acknowledge that. But a lot of the others are changing, and and they're looking for help. And I think if we can set up the right systems, where whereby farmers can see that they can refence fields if they put in a hedge, or um, that what what a lot of the farmers in our landscape are doing until recently was they were spending a lot of their own money trying to hold together a system that that used to be held together by lots of staff, and trying to drain impossible impossible wet bits and things like that and, and what's happening now is that they're looking at those spaces and saying hang on that doesn't make sense anymore and if there's another way to earn a small amount of money from that area without the costs let's be sensible very good um the last question then i'll hand back to you Pranjali. um so we, we're very conscious uh, of the, the politics around this and the green deal and biodiversity strategies there appears to be a lot of push from europe and i know it's the same uk um and a lot of finances toward um, improving our environment, uh, particularly in the agricultural front. And on the other hand, uh, we have farmers on the ground who have the potential to deliver, as we've seen yourself, uh, give nature a chance and it will recover. Where's the in-between bit, James, in terms of using that money to deliver what we want uh, uh, through agriculture? What, what do you think is a missing link? Because it doesn't seem to be working terribly well so far. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. And I may have run out of steam because I can't think of the per perfect answer for it. But um, well, you're saying I, I think there's a whole just to prompt you in terms of you said before that some of the agri environmental schemes you had to engage with in the past were a bureaucratic mess. Um, is there a better way you can imagine of of of, of that happening? Uh, yes, I, I think I would have more delegated funds where, where you've got partnerships of farmers working at a landscape scale. I think you've got to have more trust in them uh, if you're an organisation or or spending public money there's got to be more trust put in them and more delegation of the funds and measure the overall outputs across the whole landscape i think um rather than these silly nitpicky little schemes so um yeah we have, we just have absurd as, as i'm sure you do we have these sort of absurd rules whereby um yeah some of some of our woodland i don't get paid if i put any like kind of uh, livestock in them and you think hang on a minute if i put livestock in, in the right way it's good for the woodland it's good it's grazing ecology but you can't do that and uh, you can be penalized for building a pond or ha putting trees on a piece of land this is this is madness absolute madness Anjali? sorry there's a great question from Jill Her hearing. Do you have any hope for farming post Brexit or for the new environmental land management schemes? Oh. Sorry, did you hear me? I, I I didn't really. I think I got the gist of it before there was a little break, which was, do I have do I have any hope for farming after Brexit? Uh, and for the land management schemes. Okay. Uh, I don't, I don't think the ELM scheme that we're supposedly getting after Brexit exists in, any other, in anything other than theory in an office somewhere. Uh, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm underestimating them. I hope, I hope they can sort out a good scheme. Um, I, 
I think if we had a, if we lived in a sensible age with sensible politicians, I think we could do, I think we could devise a better scheme than the common agricultural policy. If I'm really honest, um, but we don't appear to live in that age, and I'm fully expecting it to be a mess. But um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, there's another question. Fabulous to see the generations of connection to place and farming traditions. Has James any thoughts on what it is that makes farming appealing or not to younger generations? Is there a farmer's personality? Uh, I don't know whether there's one farmer personality. I, I, I'm not, yeah. I, I occasionally talk to environmentalists that think they know exactly what farmers are. And when I talk to them, I think you haven't got a clue what farmers are. There's all kinds of farmers with all kinds of views. Uh, why are the young people keen at the moment? And they are very keen here. I think it's I think it's got something to do with social media. So rather than being isolated like they were in my childhood, maybe when I was 18 years old, let's say, now they're all talking to each other. They're sharing pictures of the sheep in the evenings. They're uh, they're they're validating each other. They're, they're they're reinforcing each other's sense of what matters, and they're building communities in new ways. And I think also that the old myth that going to London uh, was the answer to everybody's dreams, that you'll earn a fortune and you'll come back terribly important and rich. I think most of the kids are bright enough to know that's a load of rubbish, aren't they? But actually you end up working in Costa Coffee on minimum wage. So you might as well stop in a beautiful place with your own people and make a future there and do something useful like looking after the land and producing good food. Uh, I'll, I'll ask one final question before you, Brendan. Um, Sean O'Farrell has asked, how are you incorporating the multi-species into your swads? Okay, uh, so we're, we're trying to run the sheep and cattle together. Um, doesn't always work. Uh, yeah, uh, so we're an old-fashioned hill farm, so we don't always have perfect boundaries. Uh, so we're working really hard on that at the moment to hold things where we want them. But I really, uh, I think the greatest, the best impacts we're getting are when we run the cattle and sheep together. And I'm hoping to put a third layer to that in the next uh, 18 months with uh, 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 laying hens on the pasture, basically with a sort of roving system following the cattle around as many of the regenerative farming systems are do, and, maybe, and maybe some pasture fed chickens as well. So uh, I'm, I'm fully bought into the sort of Greg Judy, Richard Perkins type ideas. And if anybody's following this and interested in those ideas, look out on YouTube for Greg Judy for amazing grazing films. Uh, and look, if you want to think about how a small farm can pay better, follow Richard Perkins in Sweden. He's an English guy, but he lives in Sweden. Uh, and I'm very much uh, learning from them and many other people and trying to bring back a lot of good old things and do some new twists on our farm. Um, I've, I've two questions to finish off, uh, Prangeli, and, and, and maybe then James might fit in a, a quick reading before we hand over to, to, to Jane. But two questions, um, James. One is around agroforestry and um, the balance between um, farming and forestry. People want more trees to store carbon. Do you see scope for more wood pasture, at least in some of the lower hill areas? And when we talk about forestry, yeah. what kind of forestry do you think about? So we... Uh, I, I... I think we probably need in our landscape more closed canopy forest. There just was more in the past. It was in theory, it's supposed to be temperate rainforest. So there's, I think we can identify hillsides, bits of valleys where that happened. Some of it's there already, uh, but I'm completely convinced by the whole permaculture argument that we can have way more trees in our landscapes, that we can graze around them without any loss of productivity. And what we're trying to do at the moment is get field trees in. We've got lots of field, field tree cages. Uh, we've just created three hectares of um, wood pasture that we're going to graze with the belty cattle. And uh, I think on our farm, and it, this includes hedgerows, we've put 15,000 saplings in so far. I think we can get another 15, maybe more thousand trees into the ground on our farm before we start using up good productive agricultural land. There's so much edges, there's so many bad bits in a landscape like ours that you can do interesting ecological stuff on that you're not even eating into the good stuff. And I suppose the main thing, I, I know we've had this discussion in the barn, but the main thing is we're not replacing one good species rich habitat um, with another, that um, sometimes we have to make sure those um, species rich grasslands are particularly protected. Second question, there's so many terms flying around at the moment in the whole debate about farming and nature. One of them, one of the more popular ones is wilderness and um, rewilding um, rather is, is a popular term. How do you, how do you reconcile that term uh, James, or do you with, with your, your system of farming? 
So uh, the, the, the truth is, I, I, I partly wrote my book in, as a response to that whole sort of movement. And, and what I did was go away and take it really seriously. I've, I've read all the books. I've read a lot of the scientific papers. I've had most of the rewilders come to my farm and talk to me. Um, or I've been to visit them in other places or see the other projects. Do you know what it is? It's, it's a cry of despair that we want more nature. I respect that. It's, it's a very sensible focus on native habitats and natural processes. And it's a very sensible, uh, sort of, what is it? It's a very uh, sort of raw plea for us as land managers to create more nature. Up to that level, it's a really good thing. Thereafter, it's, it's very poorly thought through. So um, when you go to look at the rewilding projects, they're nearly always highly managed. They're nearly always nature mimicking with herbivores, which are, which are nearly always proxies, which are farm animals. So if you look at NEP in the south of England, um, I went there, Charlie Burrell's a really interesting, good man. He took, the first thing he told me was he manages it with a gun. Um, there's too many pigs, a pig dies. You know, there's too many cattle, they sell some cattle. There's a lot of, it, and if you follow somebody like Benedict MacDonald, who's just written the rebirding book that won the Wainwright Prize, what's he really talking about? He's talking about more extensive grazing with cattle um, in a sort of wood pasture type context. Is, is that a land abandonment? So it's not land abandonment that they're talking about. There's a, there's, and there isn't just one idea or one body of thought. It's just a sort of slightly vague term that covers a whole multitude of things. So you look at it in the Netherlands, it's about trapping large herbivores in a piece of formal wetland and, you, and let, letting starvation sort that out. Uh, you go to NEP, it's about cattle and deer. You go to, they're all completely different, doing different things. Um, what I take from it is, let's work out how to produce as much nature as possible on our kinds of farms and let them worry about some of the nuttiness because it's, there is a nutty wing to that. Grace, that's, that's, all, that's, that's I think it's a great way of reconciling, I think, um, many of those different terms um, to something meaningful. So thank you for that, James. I'm just going to sign off by, by saying that um, your story is inspirational, uh, but we also have some really inspirational farmers here in Ireland who are doing great things day in, day out for nature. We've many of them on the call tonight. And I'd encourage people to visit farmingfornature.ie, look at some of the short videos, um, give them a view and give them a vote because that's a way of, of, of us as a society saying we really do appreciate those farmers. So thank you very much, uh, James. And back to Prandley. I'm on mute there again. Uh, thank you again, James. Um, we seem to have lost your visual. Uh, but I take you're still there. Um, it's nine o'clock, so I would like to introduce you, um, introduce our next speaker to you. Um, Jane Clark is here. Um, Jane, if you can make yourself visible, um, that will be great. There you are. Um, so uh, our next speaker for this evening is uh, Jane Clark, who is a poet, and she grew up on a farm in Ros County Roscommon. So she'll talk to us about this way of life and how it has inspired her writing. She's the author of two highly acclaimed collections, The River and When the Tree Falls. So uh, she's won many awards, and, um, and there's some lovely things written about her poetry. Uh, Jane, we are very excited to hear from you. And... Um, I know Jay, you come recommended by James Rebanks as well. He so I'm so glad he made the suggestion and we were able to have you today. So um, yeah, take, you can take over. Thanks very much, Pandali, and uh, it's a real honour to be here tonight with all of you with Burn View. Uh, I wish we were in the burn, but uh, this is the next best thing. And uh, just to say, it was wonderful listening to James there. I know James well over the years. Um, uh, but, uh, and I read his book right at the beginning of lockdown and I found it really inspiring. Like I know many people tonight will have found it very inspiring. Uh, so the first poem I'm going to read is from my first collection, The River. And I chose this poem to read um, because of the dry stone walls in the Burren the dry stone walls in uh, Cumbria, where James is farming, and the dry stone walls in Roscommon, where I grew up. Dry stone wall. I'll skim the scraw, dig a trench wide and deep to hold the given stone. Lay silver grey against green, 
rocks with square planes to build off, slivers thin as slate to level in between. I lift the stones, test where they'll nestle into what's already there. Fill the middle with spalls, keep the edge stones from falling in. I use old stones, dappled with lichen and moss. Leave gaps to let the wind blow through. Nooks for pennyworth and heart's tongue to grow. I'll cover the joins, mine the batter, stack each course till it takes its place between two fields. Keep a few of the finest for the finish, long and flat capstones to span the width. It'll be the kind of wall cattle will stand by, stretching their necks for a scratch on a high stone. So uh, that, that was a poem I wrote early on in my uh, writing. I only started to write in my early 40s. And so I was going back to the farm regularly, the farm where I grew up, uh, to spend time with my family there. And it was with my parents that I actually wrote that poem um, because I sat them down at the kitchen table and said, give me the vocabulary for building dry stone walls. And they then also told me stories about all the dry stone wall builders they'd ever come across and the ones they admired and you know their experience of dry stone walls. So I suppose behind every poem in my book there is there is history there's a story there's links with generations of farmers um, okay so that's that's that one I'd, I'd like to read another poem from the first collection and um, I felt it was appropriate for this time of year and if when I started writing my parents were in their early 70s and uh, so I suppose I was observing this long relationship that had developed uh, in their, their time as farming together. And um, this poem reflects that in a way. Winter. Since the trouble with his heart, she tries to keep him in. But before the breakfast tea is cold, he shrugs on his coat, lifts his cap, blackthorn stick and heads out across the fields to count cattle and sheep, check how far the flood has risen, break eyes, ice for cows at the pond. There's not a pick on him. He feels every breeze like the beach that shelter Rooney's field. But he will not wear the scarf or gloves she offers daily. Back in the kitchen for a fry, he warms his cheek against hers, shows her his hands, thick as fencing stakes, swollen, purple with the cold. Laughing, he asks, did you ever see such shovels? Um, I suppose when I think back about the writing of these poems, I, in some ways, love was the muse. And that's love for my parents, love for the farm, love for that way of life. Um, and like all loves, it's not uncomplicated. Um, and, uh, but I also noticed, as James spoke earlier, as he got more and more into his talk, he mentioned love so many times. I don't know if he realizes that. And uh, I think that it's, it's that passion for farming, passion for the land. And that's part of why James inspires other people. But it's part of what I saw in my parents and what I found in myself when I started to write. Um, so uh, speaking of love, Back of an envelope. I don't know what's come over your father, my mother says on the phone. He left a note on the back of an envelope. Gone herding. Won't be long. Where did he think I'd think 
he was gone. All those years, if I asked where he was going, where he had been, he'd act like I'd tethered him to a post. And then today, he leaves a note. Um, so that poem, my mother kind of just gave me that poem. Some poems you work on for years and years, and then sometimes you give them the gift of a poem. Um, and so I wanted to read another poem inspired by my mother. And I suppose it's, it is that, you know, as James was talking about farming families, and, you know, I come, my father, father, the farm that I grew up on, this mixed dry stock farm in County Roscommon, limestone land as well. We've talked about limestone tonight. And um, like that's in my father's farm for generations, fa father's family for generations. But my mother, her father was a farmer. She grew up on a farm in East Galway. And then her mother grew up on a farm in uh, North Donegal on the coast. So I suppose I think the generations of wisdom and learning and habits were have been passed down through those to us you know whether and even though I don't work on a farm it has hugely influenced me and so that's where this poem comes from and I suppose I'm saying it comes through the female line as well as the male line hers my mother said she knew just knew I was going to be a girl Two boys before me and two boys after, fodder for a hungry farm, but I was hers. She taught me her tricks of the trade. It looked like dinner is nearly ready if the table is set when he comes in. Bread and butter will fill them up. Add three drops of vinegar to water so your mirrors and windows will gleam. Cool your fingers before rubbing lard into flour for pastry. A handful of ground almonds will keep your fruitcake moist. Darn a few socks every night and never leave the ironing for more than a week. Don't cut off rhubarb stalks with a knife, just twist them clean from the crown and always hold on to the children's allowance. A woman must have something of her own. Um, I suppose one thing I wanted to say about the influence of the farming life on my uh, writing is uh, there's something about um, the language that people use in farming life, the words they use, the vocabulary. And I think there is a lot of poetry in that world, in that life that people mightn't even realize they're using. Um, and so I, a lot of my poetry has come from observing and listening. And so I think, so, the people who work the farm, you know, my my brothers, my nephews, my mother, my father, all of them gave me ideas, gave me words, gave me suggestions for poems. And um, so in a way, I think, you know, there is the image of the poet who goes off on their own and writes it all on their own. But I feel that my writing is very much in relationship um, to others and from others and influenced by others. So it, my second collection, which is When the Tree Falls, was very much about the illness and death and mourning of my father. Uh, so I'm going to read a few of those poems now. And I mean, and just to say my father died when he was 87, having lived in that house and on that farm all his life and never wanting to be anywhere else. It was um, where he, it was where he wanted to be. So this poem was when uh, a stage a few years before he died when he was in hospital that I could. That I could take away from him these long days in the hospital 
the digging for a vein in his arm, the drip that stops him sleeping, the pain that makes him whisper, Jesus Christ, oh Jesus Christ, that I could take him back to his cobblestones and barn, his rooks and the birch trees, his nettles and ditches, limestone and bog, that I could find the words to tell him what he will always be, horse chestnut petals falling pink in the yard, the well hidden in a blackthorn thicket, a summer evening's hush, cattle standing orange in the shallows. So I think you'll see that in these poems, I'm in a way celebrating a way of life um, and honoring it. Uh, and again, I think you'll see that, that that word love is coming through uh, all the time. And um, I'm just go going to read uh, two more poems and then open up and see if there's some, if there are any questions. And um, I know that there are lots of farmers listening tonight or watching tonight. So you'll all know what I mean by the blue cards uh, and that they took pride of place on the kitchen table in a, an old biscuit tin. Uh, and so this one, and this one is a very close to the time my father died. Blue cards. Winter mornings, he was gone before dawn to fairs in Ballyhonas, Clare Morris, Ballinrobe. He came home with muck on his coat smelling of shorthorns and herefords. Sometimes he told us who he'd met, the blind man who knew each of his cows by their loan, the widow who bargained harder than any dealer. But mostly he sat distracted by prices, cigarette smoke spiraling to the kitchen ceiling blue cards spread around the table. Today, when everyone else was away, I wrapped him warm, pushed his wheelchair through the haggard, up the yards to the shed. The cattle lifted doleful eyes from heaps of silage. Hello, lads, he said. And uh, so just one more before I take a, a little bit of a break and see any comments or questions. I suppose, you know, when I was writing these poems about my father's illness and death and um, I, I suppose in a way it gave me a chance to pay respect to what my father loved and what he respected. And when it came to my father's wake, we had to have two afternoons of awake, two days of awake, because we knew there'd be so many people wanting to come and pay their respects to him. And that was just an incredible experience to stand there and see all these people crowding into the house uh, to see my father. But that's a testimony to my father, but it's a testimony to these people. It's a testimony to a way of life. And I suppose I just want to say like, you know, Irish life has changed so much and so many ways for the better in terms of um, diversity and acceptance of people in all their difference, differences. It's a less narrow society, but I'm really glad that we've been able to also hold on to some of these wonderful traditions. So this was about the wake. Respects. From Kiltoon, Cree Mully, Loch Glynn, Kilbegnet, Le Carrow, At League, Craigs, Carrow Peel, Ballon Leg, they come to pay their respects. They shake hands with us, stand by his body and bow their heads. Cattlemen, sheepmen, carpenters, teachers, foresters, nurses, vets. They say prayers, lay their hands on his chest and bless themselves 
then filled the kitchen with the man they knew. A grand man altogether, always out early, hardy as a wild duck, a good judge of a bullock, fierce man to work. He had woeful hands, a man of his word. I slip out for a while to see an orange globe over the common and a flock of hooper swans feasting on the last of the winter grass. So thanks very much. I'll just uh, open it up and see if there are any questions or comments there and then I can come in and read something else at the end. Jane, that was beautiful. It's it's a shame you cannot see um, the reactions of people as you're, you know, sharing these beautiful poems with us. There's there's lovely comments out there. Nikita Garner says, I, I adore the river. Winter is a real favorite, along with Kintsugi. Yeah. Uh, there's sometimes a sense in your poetry of wanting to get away or feeling trapped. Is that is this the case? Yeah, well, that's very interesting because that was one of the poems I might have read, Dusk, because you know, growing up, I did want to get away. Like I left at 17 to go off, you know, went off to Canada for two years, but then went to Dublin to study. And for me, it's a bit like James said about the young people who wanted to get away to London. And for me, you know, Dublin was freedom and it was, um, you know, where I wanted to get to. And so I think that and so I think that experience of feeling trapped on a farm is a common experience. And particularly when farm life was so traditional and particularly for women, there always was a question, is there a place for the woman here? Or if the woman has a place, has it to be a secondary place? So, you know, I, I suppose I think that has changed a lot since I was a, a child on a farm. But I suppose that's part of what I wanted to reflect on in the book. I didn't want it to be some nostalgia for a perfect um, uh, childhood because, you know, there was a part of me that really wanted to escape. But the writing brought me back in my 40s. The writing definitely reconnected me with what I loved. Mm -hmm. And James, do you have something? I know you talk about the female experience of a farming household in your book as well. Uh, do you have any comments on on Jane's poems? You're muted. Uh, can you? We can't hear you, Jane. Oh, sorry about that. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, first thing is uh, just wonderful to hear you read those poems. Do you, do you think that leave? Do you think Jane that leaving, whilst it has a cost, it also uh, it helps you to maybe to see it in a way that you might not if you hadn't stayed at home. Uh, those are really beautiful points, and they're full of observation. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that distance and the coming back. I suppose reading writing the work when I was in my early forties, it. it it is a bit like exile, you know, the Irish writer is well known as the person who had to, to leave to see their own country, you know, it's a tradition in the Irish writing, but I suppose that's what it did for me, that if I, in the leaving, then I came back and I saw things differently, and also I suppose, you know, through the writing, I was able to, you know, find a connection with my parents that I hadn't had before, um, because I was, interested in their lives in a new way but also I mean I think you write about this very much James you know the, the time when you're when your parents are just your parents and then you come back and you begin to see them as separate human beings with their own desires and their own lives and their own complexities um, but but definitely I think I think to write poetry you need to be both in very intensely and you need to be able to keep a distance I and I think that's what's the real uh, difficulty of writing poetry. If you don't have enough of a distance, it will just be some outflowing of emotion, which will matter, which will be maybe good for you, but it won't have meaning for others. You need enough of a distance to create something that leaves space for others to find themselves. That's Thank lovely. You. That, that um, echoes what Dorian says in the chat here. Really lovely, Jane. Thank you so much. Farming is a creative pursuit as well as a practical one. And it's wonderful to have it interwoven in your poems. And um, 
very evocative. Um, anonymous question. Did you read the poems about your father or mother to them and what did they think? <laughs> well, it's, uh, um, it's just very interesting. At Daddy's Wake, I was standing in the line and a farmer came up to me. I don't even know who he was because you know the way there's so many people and you can't remember. But he said to me, um, your father was really embarrassed about some of those poems. And then he said, but he was very proud of you. And I thought in a way he said it because my father and my mother are very private people. And I'm a private person too. And I mean, and I'm not intending to write memoir. I think they understood that I was creating something inspired by them, but that had, that I created something that's separate from them as well. You know, and, and, but also I think they were very generous to me and are, you know, have been very generous in understanding that this is what I needed to write about, you know. Um, but there is a distance between the poem and the person and that's important, I think. You know? Jane, do you find who are, who are the main readers of your work? Is it rural people? That's, it's a nice question from Mary. Um, I'm astonished and excited by your reading of your poems. Do you feel that poetry needs to be rediscovered, like a national love and understanding of the value of traditional mixed farming? Who reads your work, rural people or town folk? Well, God, I, I wouldn't, I'm not sure about that. I think, I think a lot of people, I think in Ireland, an awful lot of people are connected with the land, maybe even just one generation or two generations back. I don't know if you'd all agree with that, but I don't think that connect, I don't think Irish people are disconnected from the land. So I think these books are read by, you know, you know, lots of people and maybe less by farm people because I think farming people often think poetry wouldn't be their thing but then when they do find it they really enjoy it you know um, so I think they can be surprised when they find poetry that they can relate to and but you know the, so that person asked you I think it, it, it's good to have it rediscovered well I mean you know like Patrick Kavanagh the joy of reading Patrick Kavanagh or reading Shane Heaney you know but I mean uh, so I, I would love everybody to have poetry as part of their lives, you know. And again, you know, my father quoted poetry all the time, but he left school at, at 15, you know. So it can be part of a, 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 um, a farming life. I can't see why not. It would just enrich it. Jane, can I, can I share a little story? Yeah. Oh, I think James has frozen on us a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Brendan, do you have a question for, for Jane? Well, yeah, well, I think one practical question, Jane, and I just loved your poetry. If James is the cake, you're definitely the icing on the cake. And we have a few nice compliments for people, uh, from people about how the two, uh, the two presentations sat so well together, so beautiful. I just have one practical but important question um, from a couple of um, listeners. Is, where can people get your poetry, Jane? Where can people buy your books? Well, I mean, they're, um, uh, they're in most, lots of bookshops all around the country, but they can also be um, ordered through Blood Axe Books. The, pu the publisher is Blood Axe Books. Um, so they can be ordered on their website, uh, both, both books there. But, um, you know, books upstairs and lots of bookshops around the country. I'm not going to say the big online uh, sales, sales uh, because I think I'd rather people support their, own, their local bookshops if possible, you know, be great, yeah. Um, and just a couple of uh, final comments, wonderful readings and such meaningful poems. A similar Scottish poet is Jim Carruth, who writes about his own farming family and experiences and it's well worth reading. And from Rachel in Cumbria, these poems and this question and answer resonate so much as somebody who left Cumbria and fell in love with it at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so, and the last question um, uh, is about your sense of place and connection with place. Is there a place in your farm, Michael O'Donovan asks, that um, inspires you more than others that you keep coming back to for inspiration, a place on the farm? On the farm, yes. 
the river. It is actually the river. And there are these beach trees by the river where I used to go down with my father to, to, to the beach trees and talk about the trees. God, we talked about those trees so much. And they're, they're by the river. So, yeah, there is a place on the farm which I love to go back to. And I would always go back when I'm, when I'm down there at the week, uh, for a weekend. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for myself. And so, apparently, I don't know if James is still there, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll come back to you. I, no, James seem, seems to have disappeared, but hopefully he'll come back before, before we end the session today. Jane, do you want to f uh, maybe read a, a couple of more poems yeah. before we finish? Yeah, I read, I read uh, the poem, this final poem of, I tell you, I read the poem, this final poem of the first collection and the one, this final poem of the second collection. Very that sounds fantastic. Thank you. Because the first collection is called The River and the final poem of the collection is a poem that kind of reflects on the nature of breathing. The river. What surprises me now is not that you're gone but how I go on without you, as if I'd lost no more than a finger, my hand still strong, perhaps stronger, can do what it must, like carving your name on a branch from the beach by the suck, letting the river take you, so I can call myself free, only sometimes, like yesterday or the day before, last night or this morning, the river flows backwards, uphill to my door. And uh, then I'd just like to read the last poem of um, When the Tree Falls. Uh, after my father died, my brother said to me, why did we never record his voice? And that question kind of pierced me. It's that kind of thing of, oh, we can't go back. You know, the finalness of when you lose someone. But then 18 months later, I had this sense that I could hear his voice and I could hear it all over the farm. So that's where this poem comes from. Kelly's Garden. You can find him in the names of the fields. Kelly's Garden, Bacchanoptons, Malbrannans, the Santo, the Quarry, the Rocks. He's stacking square bales, chanting knots in and down, so rain won't lodge in their hearts. March and he's cursing merciless wind, cattle running amok. He's laughing at McAleer's joke about the father who welcomes his eldest home from Alberta or Azerbaijan with the only question that matters, were there many on the bus? You can hear him in the jackdaws, chack, chack, up high on galvanized roofs and in his whistling that rises and falls like the curlew calling from Emla Bog. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, I feel like I can't say anything after that. That was a privilege. Thank you so much for sharing. James, because we lost you there, will, do you have a question you wanted to ask? And, and can't hear you again. <laughs> Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. I'm really, really sorry it was the internet. Um, I'm sorry I missed some of that. Uh, I was just going to tell a really quick story, which is when I was about 18 years old, I went in one of my best friends' uh, farmer dad's Subaru pickups. And I don't know why, but I went in the glove compartment and it was so full of limericks and poems that I had to shove them all back in. And, and then I had to pretend that I didn't know that his dad spent his whole life writing limericks and poems. And it, it's, I always think of this when people tell me what farmers are or they're not. I think, ah, uh, you don't know what farmers are. Farmers are all sorts of things. Yeah. Thank you very much. We're going to have to close it at that, James and Jane. So, so uh, such a privilege to have both of you today and to start our uh, Burren Vintage Festival.